Currently, I am policy director with Prosperity Indiana. Um, I'm really glad to see this is a great turnout today. We've done three of these. We did one in Elkhart from Northern Indiana, uh, uh, second one in Central Indiana in Indianapolis, and this one in Evansville. And I got to tell you, Southern Indiana is turning out. You have the best uh, attendance population uh, that we have so far. Um, and actually really glad for that because some of these issues that we're talking about um, at the other two, we had some members of the state's General Assembly Housing Task Force who were in attendance and there weren't any legislators from Southern Indiana on that task force. So part of the reason we're here is to kind of catch you up on what those conversations were like and what we see as some of the opportunities to round out that housing affordability conversation. Uh, so before we jump into um, the programming, I hope folks got a copy. We do have the uh, um, Prosperity Indiana agenda, the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition agenda, we'll talk through that. But I do want to recognize our co-presenters um, and sponsors of this event. Um, so if I could, could I have uh, ARP, uh, Ross Foundation, and uh, Memorial CDC come up and join us and do a quick introduction of your role in your organization. Thanks, Andrew. My name is Amber Marr, and I'm the Legislative Director for AARP Indiana. We are both a Prosperity Indiana member and a member of the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition, and we're just really excited to be here. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Dee Ross. I'm the founder and CEO of the Ross Foundation. We oversee the Indianapolis Tennis Rights Union. In January, we'll be launching the Indiana Tennis Association statewide. Um, and I'm also a part of the Huger Housing Needs Coalition, but also I served on the Indiana Housing Task Force. Good afternoon. I am Sarita Cabell, the Executive Director of Memorial Community Development Corporation. Uh, we are a member of Prosperity. Reverend Brooks serves on their board, and I have recently joined their Governance Policy Committee. Policy, Policy yeah. Committee. <laughs> One of those. Um, but no, we're excited to partner with Prosperity. I always, they're always a great partner to um, help feel, feel, fuel us with the information that we share a lot of times at meetings together. So I'm so excited for everyone to be in the room. I see almost every local housing Chodo partner is here, some of our other um, youth serving organizations, Department of Metropolitan Development, and of course, Senator uh, Becker is here as well. So we're grateful to have you all here this afternoon and look forward to a lot of great dialogue on how we can continue to make Evansville great. Thank you so much, Sarita. Um, and we're going to have a chance. I want, even though this is a big group, I think it's worth it to go around and have everybody identify your organization and where you come from, the uh, type of folks that you serve in your community. Uh, real quick before I do that, um, you know, these, this is the discussion that we're planning to have. We want to talk through some of these policy agenda items and talk about what you're seeing in terms of the need for housing affordability and stability in Evansville, in southern Indiana, southwest Indiana, you know, and statewide. Um, that's the reason that why we're here. Um, for those who don't know about Prosperity Indiana, we are the statewide membership organization for community economic development. As you can see here, about two-thirds of our members are community groups, um, a lot of the types of folks that Sarita just mentioned um, who are
assistant part-time with the Memorial CDC. Um, Ms. Johnson is our supervisor. Um, the thing that keeps me up at night is just I see an increase in homeless population and I see an increase in uh, veterans. Those are the things that I see a lot of that I, I would like to focus on more. Hello everyone, I'm Karma Johnson. I am the Housing Director for Memorial Community Development Corporation and um, I am a member of Prosperity. And um, what keeps me up at night? Tenant. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I am Adrian Brooks, and I'm the one that uh, wakes her up. Eh? Good morning. I'm State Senator Vanita Becker and um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I guess what, I'm also a real estate broker with FC Tucker, so I understand the issues of affordability and lack of affordable housing because things have just gone sky high in the last two years and affordability is a very big issue. Thank you. Hello, I'm Susan Joe Thomas, and I work with an organization called Covering Kids and Families. Our abbreviation is CKF, not to be confused with KFC, which is <laughs> much more appealing to everyone, but nothing as good as Pizza King Pizza. I am um, working with CKF. We work a lot with childhood development issues, but also mostly insurance, health insurance, and making sure people have coverage. The reason I'm here today is because I'm a proud volunteer board member of Prosperity Indiana, and I have two of my besties, also known as subcontractors, that are here with me, and um, I, I think pizza. My name is Christine Georges. I'm the executive director of Tulip Tree Family Healthcare in Gibson County. We're a federally qualified health center. Um, we exist to serve an underserved population, and I grew up in this area in Evansville. Um, one word that keeps me up at night in regard to um, affordable housing is, especially in the county that I serve, is there's not any. <laughs> so I don't have one word and phrase. Hi, my name is Brandy Pirtle. I'm the program director for the Homeless Coalition of Southern Indiana. I'm also serving as the Balance of State COC regional chair for my region. We are a prosperity member. We also uh, participate in the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition. In one word or phrase, I would describe it keeps me up because of the current climate is injustice. I'm Laura Hosher and I'm with the Area Agency on Aging and I don't believe that we are a member of Prosperity Indiana um, and not necessarily one word, but we serve older adults and our concern is older adults in older homes that are no longer stable for them and them being able to age in place. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Max Happy. I'm with Pro Bono Indiana. We serve uh, low-income people with legal issues. Um, something that keeps me up this night is cost of living, generally. Um, yeah, that's a big one. My name is Katherine Ryback, and I'm retired from Indiana Legal Services, so I'm currently unaffiliated. Uh, when I ran for state rep and I was knocking on doors, I heard from a lot of people whose rental homes and mobile home parks have been purchased by out-of-state investors, and their rents went up and the maintenance went down. I'm Brenda Meyer, and I'm representing uh, CAGE, Congregations Acting for Justice uh, and Empowerment. 
and also I'm the Justice Minister for All Saints Catholic Parish, uh, in which we have quite a soup kitchen or community meal on Wednesdays. You can't find a parking spot. need um, that we see every week at our feeding program so I'm Kelly Fehrenbacher I'm the community liaison at Hope City Church and what keeps me up at night is just the word possible you know people should have the hope that it's possible to have a home good afternoon my name is Michael McQuillan and I'm here representing Lieutenant Governor Crouch uh, I work for IHCDA, which is our state housing agency. I serve there as the director of industry and governmental affairs. And um, the thing that keeps me up at night is uh, our most vulnerable neighbors, uh, the homeless, those with mental issues, and the folks we really need to get after. Hello, my name is Christine Pryor. I work for the city of Evansville's Department of Metropolitan Development. Uh, we are a Prosperity Indiana member. What keeps me up at night for the last few months is trying to help house our housing organizations, United Serving Evansville, to distill down all of the work that we need to do, do into a strategic plan so that we could all work together to find that solution to the housing issues. Hello everyone, my name is DeAndre Wilson. I represent Bedford Collab, a shared commercial kitchen here in Evansville. We focus on economic development. Recently, two affordable housing projects just went across the street from us. So how do we keep the momentum going? And then what keeps me up at night is the, the question of how do we better collaborate with each other? Hello, I'm Savannah Wood, CEO of Echo Housing Corporation. We are a PI member. And a couple words that keep me up at night are homelessness, uh, which we try to end every day, and safe housing choice. Hello, my name is Jamie Schaff. I'm the CEO and president of the Jamie Schaff Foundation. We are not a member yet. Uh, what keeps me up at night is uh, the lack of affordable housing.
that are home funds that come through the city. And I would say the thing that is most on my mind with affordable housing is something more on the front end, which is that I don't feel like Evansville has enough accessibility to mental health treatment for people who really need it. Hello, my name is Gary Allen Glass, and I am, uh, I'm going to introduce everyone <laughs> from our team. Uh, they convinced me to do that. Um, I'm the Senior Housing Counseling Specialist at CAPE, and um, with me today, I have Lawanda Harvey, who is a Housing Counseling Specialist, Toya Robinson, and Devante Campbell, who are also Housing Counseling Specialists. We are a member of Prosperity Indiana, uh, and uh, just like Pastor Brooks and Carol Ruff, nothing keeps me up at night. I go to sleep at about 9 o'clock. Uh. <laughs> but I will say that I dream often, I have recurring dreams of uh, what it is that I can do more uh, as an advocate for those in need um, and the, the memory and legacy of my mother, my late mother, Marvin Prince. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jessica Hill. I'm the Faith Relations Manager with Habitat for Humanity. Thought about housing and it is 
gradually becoming focused on free entry housing and the great need to have for more uh, housing that's specifically focused for free entry. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Moore with Center Point Energy. We are a prosperity Indiana member, I'm very thankful for that partnership. And the thing that concerns me most about housing affordability is the increasing need in solutions of all kinds. Hello, my name is Rodney Robertson. I am the property manager for the Coral CDC. And what keeps me up at night is uh, praying that we have no emergencies or maintenance issues late at night. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tamika Goins. I am a family services coordinator slash caseworker for Memorial Community Development. Yes, they are a member of Prosperity <coughs> Indiana. And what keeps me up at night are the way some of these homes look at everyone. literally rolling with us to, uh, to bring this around. Um, so last but not least, let me turn it over to Erica, who's been taking notes this whole time. Yeah, so I'm Erica Boswell. I am the Program Evaluation Manager for Prosperity Indiana. Um, I recognize some of you from our uh, Housing Stability Network. Um, and I'm not going to come up with a word, but I'm going to kind of summarize my chicken scratch and all of the ideas that you guys have thrown out. You know, there's a lot of lack of, of available, affordable, habitable units. I think that pretty much sums up a lot of that one. And then also, you know, habitable, habit, <clears throat> that word, habit, mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, and bad actor landlords. And, um, you know, I think a big thing that you guys have said, but also we've heard at other meetings, is just the ability to work together and collaborate on issues is really a big driver in actually accomplishing some of these goals. A lot of times we kind of get so bogged down in working in our own silos that we forget that other people are also working towards these issues or working towards the same solutions. So I think that is an important reminder. Thank you, Erica. And I guess, you know, I'd add what keeps me up at night. One thing is that as much as we went around the room and heard about all the great programs and um, organizations and talent and drive and smarts and dedication and heart that's in just this room, there's still all of this behind us that people are still worried about. So despite all the great efforts and, and work that's happening, there's a systemic issue um, that it sounds like people brought here without us trying to convince you of that right up front. So that's what keeps me up at night. But I think the rest of this conversation, we want to talk about what's the opportunity to leverage the people who are in this room and your experience and your voices towards those systemic policy changes. Um, so again, what we have in front of you, what we want to talk about are um, some of the, the issues that we see, we want to touch a little bit on the policy agendas you have in front of you, but then we want to turn it back over to you to have a community conversation about what needs to happen, you know, to be able to address these issues in Southwest Indiana, but also at a statewide and even national level. Um, so uh, several of you, I recognize your faces, joined us in the summer. We were in Evansville. We had a series of regional meetings. Um, don't want to rehash too much, but there's a few key insights that came 
out of that that impacted the documents you see in front of you. So that's what I'm doing is telling a little bit of the story behind how you have um, these uh, priority and agendas that you have there. So we heard from folks that there is this wealth stripping issue that we heard it a little bit here even in the housing space that people sometimes are paying. the room that even the people who are doing serving these folks are feeling some burnout they're feeling a lack of of uh, resource and investment um, to be able to counter that disruption so let me show you just a couple of examples of, of what we're seeing I know this is a little hard to read here um, but statewide poverty level. So more than one in four. Um, here in southwest Indiana, you can see that, that that plays out. There's, you know, disparities. But here in Vanderburg County, 25%. So that's exactly one in four folks here in Vanderburg County were in that place where if they lost income for three months, they'd be at poverty level. Um, and we found that that's what's happened during the pandemic and due to rising costs and prices and instability. Here it is for Southeast Indiana, for those of you who traveled over, um, that they're in that place where those disruptions put them in a more unstable place than they were before. Um, we also definitely want to mention that it, this does affect communities of color. It's sometimes hard to get this type of data at the county level, but it's important to recognize that there are clear disparities based on race um, as well as geography. Um, something else that affects folks statewide, medical debt. There, we have a recent report that came out um, finding that Indiana has the 11th highest share of the population with medical debt in collections. So not just with debt, but that it's in collections um, and highest among all of our Midwest neighbors. And that comes out to about one in six Hoosiers. So that's another thing. If we're, if we're somehow outside our neighbors mainstream on medical debt, and if we have one in four, for Hoosiers who are um, at risk of asset poverty, that's a precarious place. Um, and another issue that our members have brought to us time and time again is the issue of predatory lending and payday lending. Um, and here are some stats showing how much wealth is extracted out of our communities by payday lending. Um, so all this, I think we see the connection between this, everything that was just mentioned, and housing. Um, if people aren't, if they're having wealth extracted by pay, payday lending, if they have more medical debt than their neighbors would otherwise, then that puts them at a place where it's going to be hard for them to move up that economic ladder. So now let's connect that to housing. Um, you'll get copies of all this, so don't feel like you have to cop, uh, copy it down, but we, we think it's important to mention um, some of the stats that are here. So statewide, Indiana has a gap of over 135,000 rental units that are affordable and available to the bottom 30% of the income bracket. Um, and the term for that is extremely low income households. Um, that's in the bottom third of affordability and availability in the Midwest. And it comes out to, um, in the, those blue bars in the middle, there's only 38 affordable and available rental units for every 100 extremely low income households statewide. So think of that, like 100 of the lowest income households, only 38 of them are gonna be able to find a place that A, they can afford, and B, that's available on the market. Um, and that's uh, what it means for the other folks is that they're either doubling up or they're in a place that really isn't technically habitable or they're simply paying too much. Um, something else that I like to point out here
of severe housing cost burden of the entire Midwest. And I always think we talk so much about Indiana is a low cost of living state and is an affordable place to live. But if you're in that bottom 30% of the income bracket, that is just not the case. It's the, not compared to the rest of the Midwest. Um, again, you will get copies of all this, but I just wanted to show you briefly how the, those two stats play out here in Southwest Indiana. So I said 38 affordable and available for every 100 in Indiana. In Vanderburg County, it's only 29. three of them is very likely to be in that place where they're spending half or more of their income on housing. Um, and, and that's, I think, why we heard so much pressure on the housing infrastructure around this room to begin with. This is the reality that you were all just telling us about. Um, something else that's worth talking about is that only, or is that nine of Indiana's top 20 occupations doesn't pay enough to afford a two bedroom unit at fair market rate. So I think it's, we're talking about the housing supply side of things. It's definitely worth mentioning the income side of things as well. And on the right, that is showing Indiana's renter wage versus the black line at the top is the Midwest average year to year. So year to year, our Midwest, our, our Indiana renter wage is declining relative, or the gap is increasing relative to the rest of the Midwest. Um, so this plays out, we've been talking a lot about renters. We often hear, and it's true, home ownership is something that's important. And yes, that's true, however, if you have those disparities that we just talked about, you're going to see disparities when it comes to home ownership. And um, this is from the state's new housing dashboard um, that finds that while the overall home ownership rate is 69% statewide, it, that's 75% among white households, 37% for black households, and 55% for Hispanic or Latino households. And what really stuck out to me here, you can see the gold, that's um, 2011, the Navy is 2020. Look at that black household home ownership. In just one decade, the percentage declined from 42% to 37%. And we have, there's evidence showing that that's uh, trend that goes back much further than a decade. So all these factors, um, we talk about that ability for people to move into home ownership. Um, that's affected by what everyone has told us today. Um, okay. Touching very briefly, the pandemic had a, a big impact, ongoing price um, Raise, uh, increases have an impact, and that does play out both by geography and by uh, demographics as well. We found that black households were about twice as likely to experience housing instability um, since the beginning of the pandemic than white households. Families with children were about twice as likely to experience instability as families without children. All right. So that's kind of like, in, in addition to the things that uh, people, our members have been telling us, this is what the data says. This is what it says about housing instability, about financial instability um, statewide. And so this is what has helped inform Prosperity Indiana's new policy agenda that you see in front of you. Now let's take a detailed run through of all 27 agenda items that you see in front of you. No, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna go through every single one of those. Um, but it is worth mentioning that we have them, they're broken down by state, federal, and local agenda items. And
earlier this fall and we were lucky enough to have uh, the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition was officially recognized as a member and D was our member, uh, our representative. Um, he sat at the you know, in the committee chair seats, along with the legislators and the, the heads of various other industry groups, and we were able to participate. Um, and so do we want to start off, Amber, did you want to talk about some of that background first and what you saw? Yes, thanks, Andrew. Um, so I am sure many of you are familiar with the, the um, housing task force that took place this summer, but if not, we're just going to give a little bit of a background as far as what the three meetings uh, discussed and then sort of how this came about. So the housing task force came about from House Enrolled Act 1306, and the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition worked really hard uh, to get a member on that task force. When it first the bill was first out, it did not include um, what we kind of considered a consumer or client um, perspective. Habitat for Humanity was on it, which was amazing, um, but we just felt like there should have been uh, some other perspective on there. So the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition came together and we fought to get a place on there and we were successful in doing so. So the final uh, bill of House Enrolled Act 1306 did include a representative from our coalition. So um, they were tasked with reviewing data on housing shortages in Indiana for low income and middle income households reviewing state laws that affect the local reg regulation, uh, reviewing efforts in other states and municipalities to address the housing shortages um, through zoning or maybe local land use uh, restrictions, and then just considering other measures. And so we were really hoping that this conversation uh, expanded out a lot more than what we were originally told that the housing task force was going to address, and we think that it did. Um, the three meetings uh, throughout, there was one in September and then two in October, and the task force for the first meeting heard testimony concerning housing affordability in Indiana and discrimination in housing appraisals. And actually, Dee, who will be talking here in just a second, was our representative on the housing task force, and he actually presented about the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition as well as his own organization and how um, we are trying to move housing forward in the state of Indiana. Um, the second meeting, uh, they heard local testimony concerning local, state, and national solutions to the shortage of housing. And then the last and final meeting actually just went through the report um, which you can see there. Um, we will not go through all of those that were included in the report, but it is something that I would encourage you to take a look at if you haven't seen it. And um, actually, during Dee's presentation and throughout the meetings that he was involved in, a lot of the items that he will be talking about and sharing with you today, he shared on the task force. And I would say that the recommendations, um, there is one recommendation on the report, which is actually the final one, that ended up there because legislators on the task force brought up things that Dee had talked about that actually were not included in the report. And I'm going to let Dee talk about that. But um, a few of the other items that were on the final recommendation just de dealt with appraisal discrimination, um, housing stability, local zoning, including ADUs or accessory dwelling units. And then I'll let Dee talk about the other one that we wanted to highlight. So that's just a, a quick rundown of the housing task force. And I'm going to let Dee also talk about it since he was our representative. Hello, everyone. Um, so to be quick and uh, brief, so when we was on the task force, you know, I was, other than uh, Rep. Cherish Pryor, I was the only uh, African-American on the task force. Uh, so it was good to have a, a representation from, you know, a person of color on, on that task force and someone just have lived experience. I've been, I lived in a shelter before. I've been homeless before. I know what it's like to drive around um, in my car to stay warm at times. Um, and I've been unlawfully evicted. And so just having that representation is everything uh, because usually you, you guys all been to the state house. It's not enough people with lived experiences at the table. And that's what it's gonna take to change the dynamic in the state of Indiana when we get people, we organize people across the state who are impacted in urban, rural, uh, metro, all areas, uh, and come together collectively. But a couple of the stories I shared really resonated and hit home uh, with a lot of the task force uh, committee members. And one of them was uh, with our Indianapolis 
this tennis right she in. We work with an uh, elderly woman who uh, child had uh, mold in their system. Um, her home was filled with black mold due to a slumlord, and, and the landlord did not want to work with that rest of the tenant to get it resolved. Due to that, the, the, um, the child was not allowed to come back to daycare because she was sick, and during COVID-19, we all can resonate with that. Um, and so that forced the mother to take off of work to take care of her child because she could not, she did not have another babysitter, which led to her losing her job, which led to her being evicted from her home, and which led to her catching COVID-19 and dying two weeks later. When I talk about housing, you know, this is a, a life or death situation. Housing is healthcare. And another example is, there's a, another lady who got a job at Greensburg, in Greensburg, Indiana, working at Honda. And we all know about the gas prices uh, skyrocketing. And, and so she couldn't afford to get back and forth to commute to Greensburg, Indiana from Indianapolis. And so she was looking for a home closer to the Honda plant, but she couldn't find nothing that was affordable or that was available because of the shortage, we are 50,000 homes behind in the state of Indiana in uh, building homes in general. But one of the key things that uh, when we, it's imperative when we're talking about these recommendations, we have to talk about the implementation, uh, the rollout, because it's a lot of laws and a lot of policies, but the imp implementation is so important to all these concepts. Um, and when we talk about affordable housing, we have to raise the flag that before COVID-19 in Indiana, housing being a crisis, we were number two in evictions filed behind New York City, and we're not nearly that population. And, and so when we talk about affordable housing, we also have to talk about racial inequities. Black and brown families are disproportionately don't even have access, the same access to affordable housing when they are even available. So when we're putting out of affordable housing uh, and asking for more homes to be built, we gotta make sure that everyone has an equitable chance to get in their homes. And we cannot just stop at, okay, oh, we back hitting our number of 50,000 homes, we're above, we in the red, we're not in the black, I mean, we in the black and not in the red. We have to do more and more and more. Uh, one of the things that we uh, recommended that wasn't in the final listing was a rent, es rent escrow. So when we talk about rent escrow, we're talking about some landlords who fail to fix up the, the deplorable living conditions to come in their homes and make sure everyone is habitable. Um, and so if they fail to do that, you know, you guys know the law that you cannot withhold rent uh, in the state of Indiana, even if you live in an inhabitable living condition. We want to four states that still says that's a law. So a rent escrow can help combat that for the time being by making sure that the tenant is still paying their rent, but it's not going to the landlord too until they complete uh, the renovations or solve the issues within the home. So that's something we recommended that we did not see. But when we talk about habitability and um, addressing deplorable living conditions, that's something that was added as a recommendation. So I do appreciate the task force for adding that one because everyone deserves to live in habitability homes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dee. And so, you know, again, those, that real world experience of what our families are having to go through isn't just a state of nature. Um, as you can see behind us here, Indiana is one of only a few states that does not allow 
that rent escrow issue so some of the folks who are living in the the mold in the poor health conditions had no way to enforce already existing health and safety standards and that's something that really struck me when i started to learn about this is these are brand new standards that we're trying to apply it's just there's no way to enforce them unfortunately indiana incentivizes some of the unfortunate bad actors that are out there to continue to just extract the wealth from our communities and put their health in danger. So that's why this is a top priority of the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition. Um, and just a couple others that are worth mentioning um, that we've talked about is, is um, emergency rental assistance has unfortunately dried up across the state. Uh, the federal emergency rental assistance from the American Rescue Plan Act um, has dried up. Um, the portal, the statewide portal is closed. Um, and while there are some federal solutions that are being described, um, we're proposing that Indiana create a housing stability pilot fund. Um, and it's up to them. They can use remaining um, COVID relief funds that may still be on the table, or if we want to use the general fund, uh, up to them. But there needs to be something to bridge the gap until there can be a, a permanent federal program. Um, let's see, there's a few other things that are on here in, in terms of a court-based eviction diversion program. Um, there's a few other things that I think are, you know, worth talking about if you have questions. But at this point, what I'd like to do is to turn it over into more of a, a community conversation with folks here. Um, and I'd be interested to get people's reactions and what you think. But Senator Becker, not to put you on too much of a spot, but I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. in a single parent household with five brothers and sisters. And uh, my father did not pay child support. Um, my mother worked as a waitress. She graduated from high school the same year I did. So uh, that tells you I have a lot of empathy and I have a lot of ability to understand a lot of these issues mostly because of my background but a lot of these legislators unfortunately don't live in the real world and they need to be reminded and i would just encourage each and every one of you to reach out to your local state reps and your local senators and share with them your concerns about affordable housing you can make a difference and your input makes a difference, but you have to be there. You have to um, remind them on an ongoing basis about what the real needs are for people. So I encourage you to do that. I know that Ryan Hatfield does a great job. He's a fellow Democrat, but I will, you know, I told him I'd support him for mayor. He told me he'd support me for mayor. <laughs> Well, neither one of us are going to run from here. <laughs> so anyway, I just, uh, I think it's so important and to, to reach out and to touch people's lives to make sure that they understand where you're coming from and what the needs are for people in the state of Indiana. Because I, I, as I said, I, income disparity is real. And uh, people need to understand the needs out there for people. So I encourage you to do so. Thank you. Can I ask you, uh, I'm just curious, what, what is the best way to approach a legislator? Is it call them, write them? Could you state that again so that we capture that? I'm, I'm just, because, um, you know, we have some things on our policy agenda statewide for Habitat. And I just want to, what's the best way to contact your legislator and get a meeting with them and um, actually have a sit down conversation?
of the best things you could do is um, there are once a month we have what we call meet your legislators or beat your legislators <laughs> either one uh, meetings at the Browning Room at, at downtown Central Library and they start at 915 and they go until 11 o'clock and um, Every legislator from this area, including Warren County, are invited to attend. I've been doing those meetings ever since I started in the legislature. I can tell you, some people, some legislators don't show up because they know there will be people there that will not agree with them, and they'd rather not have to deal with that. I know I talked to, um, a fairly new, two fairly new representatives last year, and I said, why aren't you coming? They had been told by another legislator not to come because they'd have to deal with people that didn't always agree with them. Well, you know, if you're in this position, you're going to, that's part of the job, and, and that's part of what you sign up for. The first one is January 14th. Um, in fact, I had an email. The second one is, um, around the 14th of February, and there's one in March and April. Uh, you can come to those meetings, you can, usually legislators. Uh, Jeff Thomas is always there. I'm always there, unless one of us are sick, and we both go. Usually Ryan Hackwell comes, unless he's got another obligation. Uh, but beyond that, I would say, encourage the rest of them, both Warren and Vancouver County, to be there because uh, you learn a lot. I mean, I, I ask people their feelings about issues, and we usually have between 80 and 100 people there and um, that come every meeting. And you know among 80 or 100 people, you're, everybody's not going to agree with you. Uh, that's part of life especially politics. But, and you can also email, we all have email, and you can email, you can still do snail mail. Uh, I just think it's important for people, I think we as legislators do a better job representing people if we hear from the people that we represent. Uh, so I would encourage you, those will be the, the best ways. But I think, I think those public forums are good because you will find that while not everybody agrees with you, you'll also find that there will be a lot of people there that do agree mm -hmm. with you. Uh, we have a moderator. It's uh, Josh Claiborne is, the, is going to be the moderator this year. He did a fine job last year. And I know one time Jim Tom said we had a different moderator beforehand. He said, I don't trust those moderators. They're pulling out questions. He said, Benita, you pull out the questions. I said, oh, okay, I'm right here. The basket's here. You can sign in when you come into the meeting, and you can write down your question. And not every question is going to, there won't be time to hear every question. And we try not to duplicate for that reason, so that maybe there's 10 people that would like to talk about the same issue, but we'd like to get rid of get to other people on other issues. So that's that's what I encourage. Okay. Andrew, can I add something just for those? Um, Beth, you don't, Mr. Litter, little man, Colin Radar, as well. Um, he's great about rounding up all the legislators and getting them over to different Uno events and, and, and most definitely Goose County events. So. I know we served on what two panels last year that had majority of, or, or a decent amount of turnout for those legislators. So if you get on his radar, he will not miss you in his rounds and he will drop every paperwork off and newsletter and let you know what's happening, especially if there's some, some guests for them to be there. And since we're talking about this now, we have this as part of our wrap up, but I think it's worth us just mentioning it now. Um, Hale, would you like to talk about some of our upcoming advocacy training and events? Absolutely. Hi everyone, I'm Neil Carmelega, I'm Prosperity and Indiana's Coalition Coordinator. So here's some events that are coming up that I want to make sure everybody knows about because they're more chances for you to engage on these issues and some of these are trainings to help you engage better. Okay. 
So just really quick, I want to know that we have a series of advocacy academy series that's all part of one step ladder. I'll cover that in a second. Um, we are obviously finishing up our last policy and pizza series. And then all of this is to lead up to the Prosperity Indiana Summit and Prosperity Indiana State House Day, where we have meetings with you and your legislators at the State House. Um, really quick, before I go to the next slide, though, I'm actually going to pass it to Dee to talk about that last event there, which is something that he is the leader on. Hello, everyone. So on February 13, mark your calendars, we'll be uh, organizing a housing advocacy day at the State House where we'll be bringing people across the state uh, to share their story, you know, bringing tenants and anyone that's been impacted by this housing crisis to the table, because usually we don't have enough representation or lived experiences uh, given a platform to share their story. And so the Housing Advocacy Day, we did one earlier this year. We changed the language, uh, used to be called Tenant Day of Action what is um, now is called Housing Advocacy Day, and it'll be hosted by the Indiana Tenant Association and uh, with partnership with Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition. All right, thank you, Dee. So, yeah, we actually have two days in the same month where you can come to the State House, and we will help you organize everything that you need to know. So that's really exciting. Um, let me jump backwards, though. We have a series right now that's going on to prepare you for those state house meetings. So a lot of you may not go to the state house regularly, and we want to help prep you so that you feel ready and you know what you're getting into and you feel prepared to actually have those important conversations. So we just had the Advocacy 101 event. It was called The Rules. If anybody would like access to it, please reach out to me. I can send you the recording. We had somebody from Advocacy... Um, Boulder Advocacy, I apologize, come talk about the laws behind lobbying because that's really important as nonprofit providers. So that one already happened. If you'd like access to it, though, I'd be happy to give it to you. The next one coming up is Advocacy 102. It's called the Strategies. And in this session, we're going to be talking about the specific strategies you use once you get that meeting. What do you say? Or if you even want to do a tweet or a letter, any of that, how do you engage in a way that's going to be successful? How do you use data? How do you build ongoing relationships with your legislator? Things like that. And we will be having all of our advocacy partners speak on this issue. So it's going to be people who do this all the time, telling you exactly how they do it. And then uh, the third one there, Advocacy 103, is the plan. So that session is really important because we talk about all the logistics of State House Day. It's going to be a busy day, but you'll know in advance what you need to know. And um, we're also going to be putting everything into action that we learned in the first two. So I'm really excited about this part. We're going to have a simulated legislator meeting, probably multiple. And basically, it's going to have somebody pretending to be a legislator and someone going through the motions of what it's like to talk to one in case you haven't done that before and you want to know what it really looks like. So that's going to be really, really helpful. As you can see, it's kind of a step ladder um, series to help you be prepared to have these conversations. Um, and then, like I said, all of this is leading up to two things, Prosperity Indiana Summit and Prosperity Indiana State House Day. So our summit is something that is one ticket free if you are a PI member. So make sure you look into that if you are a PI member. Um, if you want to bring any members of your team, there's an extra cost to that, but it's not too bad. And it's a full day of learning and um, being around other peers. And then luckily, while you're already in town, the very next day, that's when our State House Day is. So there's kind of the benefit to going to one because then you have very good reason to be at the other. And at the other event, like I said, this is your opportunity to engage with your legislators. We have a couple of different things that are going to be going on that day. Um, aside from just legislator meetings, which, by the way, if you end up even after the series not feeling ready to go into those by yourself, we're going to help you get a team. We're going to help you schedule them so that your hand is being held with us the whole way. Okay, and then um, I just want to highlight one more time the event that Dee talked about. It's going to be yet another State House Day with a very specific housing focus. Um, another really great opportunity to get in touch with your legislators. Okay. All right, thank you. Just a quick time check. We have about 15 minutes left. There's still plenty of pizza and soda, so please feel free to, to go get that. I want to turn it back to folks in the room. Could you raise your hand if you've been participating in the, the Housing Stability Network, the Emergency Rental Assistance Based Housing Stability Network? Okay, so we've got Brandy and we've got Cape. 
um, from uh, the New Albany area, right? So, you know, that part of Southeast Indiana and we have Southwest Indiana. Erica, would you like to come up and just kind of, you know, for people who may not be aware, tell them what that is. And we want to make sure that everybody in this room are aware that even though the emergency rental assistance portal is closed, there are still ongoing services available. Yeah, so with the um, federal emergency rental assistance funds that came down uh, during COVID, part of that funding went to providing housing stability services. Um, and so that looks like housing counseling, that looks like um, helping with uh, legal services, although that's a little different arm. But what we're focusing on is the Housing Stability Network was formed from um, in an effort to distribute those emergency rental assistance dollars. And so it is a network across the state and covers all 92 counties. Um, and it is that like storefront location, people could walk in and get assistance applying for those federal dollars. Unfortunately, the rental assistance is dry, but we still are offering housing counseling services, and we're still looking for innovative ways to bring people in, because as we all know, a lot of times, like we mentioned financial literacy, a lot of times um, some of these issues are just perpetuated by generational education or experience um, and they just are they need further support outside of just having a roof over their head in order to maintain that stability and so our housing stability network is here to help with that um, but we also partner with um, the indiana bar foundation um, to provide similar services with the legal aid across the state um, working to do the, um, so they also have funding through those emergency rental assistance dollars to provide aid to those facing evictions. And they also have just recently launched kiosks um, throughout the state. I believe the number last I heard was at 122. There are 122 kiosks um, around the state and they kind of look like, um, like an ATM. Some of them are desktop in libraries, but the majority of them look like ATMs. They're in courthouses, they're in libraries. Um, they're, the rule is they have to be open to the public six days a week for a certain number of hours. Um, and so people can go there and log on to indianalegalhelp.com and access a legal navigator to kind of help walk them through the process. So if they've got an eviction notice and they don't really know what to do, they can find one of these kiosks and a legal navigator will help walk them through that. Um, yeah. I think then, you know, I want to make sure since we have two of those providers here, um, you know, it, <laughs> Brandy, is there anything you would want folks here to know about that or how, just your perspective of how that fits into the need that we've talked about so far? I would say that the Housing Stability Network is definitely um, not possible without collaboration across the across your region. Uh, we're lucky enough um, in Clark and Floyd County specifically where we cover in Harrison, um, that we all know what each other does. We all are able to connect with each other. We're all able to work with one another. Um, so that dollars go further, uh, there's less duplication of services because we are able then to provide more. And it is that network of stability that we're able to give to all of our clients that come in. We see over 100 clients every month that we deal with and we're able to um, work with at least half of them in stability and providing stability for them. I would say that while all the rental assistance did dry up, there are still opportunities for like first month's rent, working with landlords, um, getting to know your landlords better so that you can work with them and seeing what they're uh, willing to work with for your clients um, because there is still f funding for that first and last month's rent and deposits and stuff, so. Thank you. Do you want to come up? So I think, 
rather than trying to haul this all across the room, if there's other comments or questions you have, just please come up here and we want to make sure that we get to folks before the end of our time. So if you would, again, remind everybody your name and organization. So I wanted to let everyone know tonight, the Evansville Promise Zone, we'll be having a community discussion. I know a lot of people do great things in this community. We'll be talking about a lot of different things. So we will have principals, teachers, parents, some of our students, and we're just touching on a lot of the stuff that's going on here in Evansville. So if you would like to come, I can give you our address. It will be at the YNE Center, 5.30 to 6.30. We won't have pizza, but we'll have some snacks and stuff. So. If you would like to come and just kind of hear about some of the stuff that's going on in our city and what we want to do to move forward, again, it's at 5.30 to 6.30 tonight, and there will be a great discussion. So everybody is welcome. And I also want to give a huge shout out to this gentleman right here. Uh, I'm happy you are a part of all of this because I know what you do in Indianapolis. I follow a lot of what you do. So to have somebody representing that really is doing some work in uh, grassroots organization. I love it. So thank you all. I'm happy I was able to come today. Hopefully I'll see some of you tonight. Yeah, please come up. And as you're coming up, I'll just point you, this is an opportunity to weigh in. Um, we mentioned that the housing stability and emergency rental assistance, this is what we need to get that going at the federal level. So I encourage everybody to make sure that you're participating there. So again, uh, we do have a housing work group that we are uh, planning and looking for um, new initiatives for 2023. Um, if you're not connected with that, we would love for you to be. Uh, you can contact me, uh, Silas Matcham, or uh, Christine Pryor at the city. I'm pretty sure most of you have our information, but we'd love to have you at the table. I also want to take into consideration, because I've really been focused around this really quick, I feel like we have the best housing developers here in Evansville. I think we can develop at mass rates. I, th I think that the people are here, we have the knowledge base to do it. But I think the access to it, which is getting people qualified to move into these houses, is where we are not having conversations around. So how do we fix people's credit so they can afford the homes that we're building? What do we do about that? So I want to take that into consideration as we're talking about the need for housing, what are we talking about their credit and getting them prepared so that they can have the affordable house or move into a home that we all want everyone to live in, to live in? Thank you so much. All right, we have a couple minutes left. Anything else? I'm sure somebody's, something's burning that you haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Can I speak on behalf of the old people? <laughs> yeah. Bring the, the mic to you, Reverend Brooks. I want to speak on behalf of those of us who have been doing this for 30 plus years. Sometimes uh, we are a reservoir of information that can be tapped into. We're very open. We don't have agendas. We're old now, so we don't have any agendas. But we like to share. You have nothing to be intimidated about. We're open books. We can show you the importance of collaboration. You're on the campus of the Memorial Community Church. We serve the community. There is on our campus, there's a subway, there's senior housing, multifamily, there's single family residential, there's youth programs, there's after school programs, there's, there's a collaboration with the hospital, a clinic. New doctor just started over there, so now we've got another doctor just started at our clinic over there at the uh, Memorial Clinic. It's a child care here on site as well. We're an open book. If people want to, but there's 24 hours in a day. We got to sleep about nine of those now. I used to say I needed six. It's about nine of those now. But we welcome anyone that wants to talk with us or if you want to come and just tour our facility. Tour, we'll take you to the Dollar Tree, to the <laughs> Memorial <laughs> Lofts. We'll take you to both sites. We will, we will let you see how we have collaborated with Habitat and others to sometimes Habitat's on one side of the block, we're on the other side of the block developing that block. We're doing it right now over at the 200 uh, block of Wagner. 
we, we, we have a, a good relationship with so many. And what that does at the end of the day is it helps the people who need it most. Because in our collaboration, we also bring down the price of development, mm. which doesn't have to be then passed on to the end user. And thank you, Senator, for being here. Mm -hmm. You've always been supportive, and we're, we're forever grateful for that. And, and again, when we talk about affordable housing, we're also talking about reutilizing space that currently is not creating tax revenues. It's, it's, it's not providing secure, safe, affordable housing for people. If you, look at, if you really look at this affordable housing thing, one of the things you also find out is families that live in affordable housing, their children perform academically better with that safe, clean housing. You live longer, you have less health issues, and a part of our mantra here is, we don't build anything that I won't live in myself. Mm -hmm. And so for us, I know it's not always appropriate to talk about your faith, but faith is what motivates us. It, it's what drives us here. And so we do our best with what we have, and we are not a rich church. But we are a committed, faith-based operation that seeks to make the community that we're blessed to serve in better. That's it. And uh, we can't do it all, and we don't try. Lord knows I learned you can't do it all. When I was young, I thought you could. So you might want to come talk to me about that too. But, but we are here as a resource. And, uh, and sometimes I, I think we operate in our silos and we suffer in our silos. You don't have to suffer in your silo. We are a resource here. And sometimes you just may want to just stop by and pray. It's okay. We can do that too. But uh, I, I just thought I would take that moment to, uh, to say, we've been doing this for a long time. And uh, we've learned from our mistakes along the way as well. You don't have to make the same mistakes that we made. We can tell you, you want to watch that minefield over there. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, for being here and, and for allowing us to host what I think is a very important gathering of people who love this community and who are doing great work here. Uh, our, some of you have been great collaborators. I mentioned Habitat. There's also uh, Hope, Echo, uh, DMD always. Um, and, and then there's corporate, the corporate community, along with the hospitals and others. Um, so just if you're thinking about development, putting together a development team just putting together a development team that will carry out the mission that you have, not that they have, because everybody won't fit with your mission. And so that in itself is a process, putting together a development team that really and truly believes in the work that you're doing and are not just there to pimp you. We can help you with that process as well. Just thought I would throw that out. If anybody needs a definition of pimp, just see me later. Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to say, what better way to end? I don't know about that last sentence, but still, let's give Memorial CDC one more hand for hosting us here today. Thank you. Um, and I'd be remiss uh, if I did not let you know that if you did want to join the network, here's how. Um, and also, let's give a hand to Senator Vanita Becker. Thank you so much for your time and your participation, your advice, and your support and championing of these issues. So thank you so much. So thanks everybody for coming. We'll stick around if you have any individual questions, but really appreciate all of your participation. Have a great day. <laughs>